Uh, hello and thank you for joining us and welcome to the Fishing for Data webinar. This is actually our second webinar of the day to enable for as many as possible to attend regardless of the time zone you're in. My name is Patrick Orange. I'm a physical oceanographer based at the Swedish Meteorological and Hydrological Institute and I'm also Deputy Coordinator of EMONET Physics one of seven thematic data portals within the European Marine Observation and Data Network. The initial plan was to have a three-day workshop in January on these dates, that's the 19th to 21st of May. But due to the current COVID-19 pandemic, this has been postponed for next year. Dates still to be decided on later. This webinar is a pitch for that main event and to keep the momentum, the announcement of the general workshop created. A lot of my work has been in bringing together diverse marine communities in order to enhance the cooperation, collaboration, and harmonizing data flows, and by this, make a much greater range of marine data discoverable and accessible. I first met Cooper van Branken, founder and director of Bering Data Collective, at a conference less than a year ago. He introduced me to their activities, linking programs, and fleets already collecting marine data and how they're working on connecting this to the oceanographic community. To me, it was immediately clear that this is something the oceanographic community can really benefit from. Since then, we've been working together to plan and explore the possibilities and opportunities. There are a number of groups who've been working in this direction for some time, but it's early days for us in coordinating these groups and data flows. And in the next 30 minutes or so, we will present progress to date and future plans. We welcome people and groups working in similar initiatives to join us and anyone listening who collect marine data that they want to share to a bigger community. During the presentation, we'll be conducting a Q&A session using the question window. It's open, so you can start asking questions now if you like. And after the main presentations, a Q&A session will be moderated by Berthe Fastenhout, Chief Data Officer at Bering Data Collective, who will, uh, who will select a number of questions and our panelists will answer. Joining us for that session are James Manning from NOAA, Michela Martinelli, CNR, Marco Alba, ETT, and Paul Holtus, World Ocean Council. We'll also have a question poll during the session to get a better understanding of our audience and input for possible future webinars. The session is being recorded and you'll find the recording, presentations, results from the poll, and answers to your questions later in your mailbox. First out is Antonio Novellino, coordinator of EMONET Physics, to give us an introduction to EMONET and EMONET Physics. Antonio is based at ETT in Genoa, and he'll be followed by a presentation by Cooper van Branken. Last but not least, Many thanks to our collaborators and sponsors, World Ocean Council, Copernicus Marine, Sea Data Net, and EmoNet. Antonio and Cooper, I hand it over to you. Thank you, Patrick, for your kind presentation. Welcome, everybody. So I'm going to give you an overview of the European Marine Observation Data Network, and in particular of the physics uh, thematic lot under which we are trying to create this new community and uh, create this new and very interesting data sharing. The, modern, uh, Euro uh, the European Marine Observation Data Network is a long-term data initiative created from the European Commission about 10 years ago. Uh, the basic goal was to collect data once and use it many times and reduce the fragmentation of the data sources and the collection research and infrastructure. The data infrastructure was developed to, towards a stepwise approach in three major phases that ended, uh, are ending in uh, this year. But the Commission is already looking towards the next phase that is covering the next decade. And within this umbrella, the uh, European Marine Observation Data Network Program, the uh, Commission developed this uh, um, program by developing uh, thematic projects. So we have one dedicated project for each topic. So we have a project for the bathymetry, one for geology, one for seabed habitats, 
a chemistry, biology, and now we are, uh, a, a, we are managing the modern physics. In parallel, there was also created uh, a transversal um, uh, system that is the data ingestion facility that is also helping to collect, I mean, uh, orphan data and uh, new data from new sources. Going to the modern physics, the basic goal of a modern physics is to integrate and make available ocean data. And we are covering uh, um, a different uh, time ages, uh, data uh, ages. We go from real time to near real time to historical representative uh, uh, data. And uh, these data are coming from various sources. Uh, we are uh, collecting data from uh, fixed platform like uh, like moving buoys or moving platforms like surface load. And we are in charge of uh, different parameters, the ocean physics parameters, temperature and salinity of the water column, sea level, wave winds, uh, currents, and so on. Started, the basic goal was to make available product of ocean physics. And by building on available infrastructure, redistribute and make available the available products and develop new uh, and wider, uh, more complete data collection and products on top of these data collections. As said, as introduced by Patrick, uh, the basic goal was also to make this metadata, data and products uh, findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable. And to do so, we, since we started, we were using and promoting the harmonization and common standards. So going to the data and scope, as uh, just said, the basic goal of a modern physics is to link several sources into a single discoverable database. And we are doing this kind of activity by developing smart adapters. And the data flow is designed in collaboration and coordination with the, with the key European integrators and programs, and in particular with the Copernicus Marine Environment and Monitoring Services, uh, and in particular with the Institute situ TAC uh, thematic assembly, and the Sea Data Net Networks of National Geographic Data Centers. But we are also collaborating with other European key uh, infrastructure for uh, data hosting and data collection, like the International Council for Exploration and Seas, and, and other players, but, uh, and we also had uh, an eye on international system and global system like Coriolis, uh, Global Data Synthesis Center, but also other communities uh, like uh, South Ocean Observing System or the American, of, uh, the American uh, Integrated Ocean Observing System or the Australian one. And as we said, I mean, we are integrating and making available uh, um, data and uh, products coming from different platforms that uh, most of the time have, have already a well-defined uh, data flow infrastructure. But for teams or platforms not covered yet, and modern physics start implementing this not, uh, data flow. And this is the case of the webinar of today. We found these new innovative, very interesting data sources, and we want to create and harmonize the data flow into the system to make this data available for a wider use and adoption. So from input to products, as I said, we are developing smart adapters that are collecting and integrating these different sources and federated data. Then we do some checks at the level of metadata. So we feel what is missing by adopting common standards. And for example, we are using the CDATANET P02 vocabularies for the parameters or the uh, European Directive for Marine Observa uh, Organization uh, to identify the providers and the institutions that are contributing to the data dissemination. Then once we have this data harmonized and, and ready to dissemination, we make them available by, uh, via different dissemination channels because we are making available metadata or uh, the data itself that could be time series or profile or aggregated data with the data map layers and so on. And as said, on top of this data, we are also uh, applying some processing features in order to make create new products and make them available via the same channels. Concerning the quality check and quality flag, we, uh, it depends on the time age of the data. So uh, if we are speaking about near real time, real time and near real time data, we have semi-automatic procedures. While if we go for more 
um, delayed more data, then these quality checks are also applied by experts that could be experts of the platforms, experts of the parameters, or regional experts, which uh, who knows very well the climatology of the place. And in general, we rely on the uh, data sources of the integrators behind us for the quality check and quality flag procedures. And on top of this data flow, we created a, a web portal which make available all this information. And since we started, we had a look at the global coverage of uh, the data. So uh, just accessing uh, the, European, uh, the modern physics web portal, you can play and uh, have a look at all this data. And for each specific platform, we created a dedicated view. So for example, in case of the Argo, that is for example, the uh, panel on top left, uh, uh, user can see profiles, while in case of uh, a mooring or a tight gauge, you can see the time series of the data collected. And then we also created a camstone view for other parameters in case of wind or radars or specific view in case of graded data and products. But I really um, uh, uh, encourage you to play with the web portal and try and use the different links that you have in the presentation that direct you to the different uh, places. Uh, to say that on top of these services, we also created the application program interfaces a widget in order to facilitate the adoption and the use of all these data and products to also you know, uh, expert uh, users. So by means of this kind of tool, uh, you can easily integrate, uh, I mean, for example, a chart in a third party website. And so make available this data and adopt and use this data. Going uh, to the point of uh, the idea of the webinar of today, uh, we would like uh, to follow and uh, try and have the same success that we had with the HF radar, that is an, a nice technology that is used uh, to collect information about sea surface currents. In the past, there were several research and development projects that were using or developing the technology. And in 2014, we were asked to start working on this new technology. Then Eurogoose uh, created a task team on that and together we set up a first coordination event. And the idea of having, uh, I mean, the workshop uh, was exactly the same, to have this uh, initial coordination event. In case of the HF radar, I mean, in a uh, few weeks, we were uh, in contact with the other global communities, the Americans and the Australian people. In 2015, we had already some data in physics and in collaboration with other projects, we were developing uh, uh, the quality check and quality flight procedures. Uh, we were working on uh, in understanding how to integrate this data flow into the Copernicus Marine Environmental System and how to take, uh, how to uh, guarantee the long term stewardship of this data in collaboration with CDataNet and CData Cloud. And since the beginning, we were pushing this, uh, I mean, activity towards the global. Uh, integration and use of the data. And in fact, today, we are in 2020, many projects and infrastructure are using this at a global level. Uh, the community is uh, keeping working on developing new products on top of this data. And within C physics, we had similar activities, a similar success story, also with Ocean Glider, uh, Ocean Glider uh, European River Data, and Marine Mammals. Another story that I would uh, like like to uh, tell you is about the collaboration we have the, with the South, uh, Southern Ocean Observing Systems uh, because it's very uh, important uh, and very productive the collaboration that we established. Uh, the, you know, we started working together several years ago when from the SUS community uh, we had the request on uh, trying to identify the uh, possibility to host uh, data, harmonize the data flow, and make available this data by means of uh, a map viewer. So we started collaborating because we were really keen uh, to provide this kind of feature, and in turn, we were collecting uh, more data. We were feeding the system with more and new data. And in a few uh, weeks, uh, I would say, uh, we were engaging a very huge community, and nowadays we have a very uh, huge community that is contributing uh, to deliver the data, make available the data for a wider use and adoption. 
Again, I, I really encourage you to look at the website following the links. And now we move to the focus of uh, today's webinar and I give the stage to Mr. And thank you very much, Patrick, for the introductions and Antonio for the background on marine data and the precedent for bringing emerging programs and technologies like ours forward. But also thank you to everyone else who's, who's in attendance. You're an incredibly diverse group and really coming from all over the world, which is something that I'm, I'm quite um, excited about. So let me just share my screen here. So um, this presentation um, will be available on video as well as uh, available for download as PDF afterwards. And there are links throughout um, so that um, if I don't dig into something in as much detail as you might like, um, there should be links for you to start looking into that in a little bit more detail. So starting with the background and introductions to fishing gears and how they can collect ocean data, followed by the potential impact to the larger oceanographic community and how this data can supplement existing observation technologies and programs. Next, sensors and data, followed by two highlighted programs, the leaders of which are on our panel today, so you can ask them questions at the end during the Q&A session, followed by our contributions to bring this community together and start working on a standardized data flow, and then concluding with future directions that we're all particularly excited about. And so, as you can see from this map, this really is an emerging global network. Um, with orange dots pointing out scientific-led initiatives to collect ocean data with fishing gear, and the green dots are industry-led programs. So you can see in the northeast of the U.S., EMOLT, Environmental Monitoring on Lobster Traps. This is founded by Jim, sorry, Jim Manning, one of our panelists. Um, and then on the, in the Adriatic, we've got FOOS, which is the Fishery and Oceanography Observing System, led by Michaela Martinelli, another of our panelists. Now, as this webinar announcement went out and really started gaining a lot of traction, we kept having to redo this figure because we were adding more and more points to this map. And that's something that I'm really happy with as this, is a, this was one of our key goals of the workshop and now turned webinar is to bring more programs to the table. So we're confident out of the, this webinar and future initiatives that more and more programs will come to the table and we'll continue to expand this map. As mentioned before, there are polls mixed in uh, for you, the attendees throughout. So I think you're about to get the first one of those. And so talking about our background, myself and the core BDC team, we actually come from a fishing industry and fishery science background, not at all an oceanography background. And how we got interested in this was by what we saw as the future of fishery science riding on, a coat, on the coattails of advances in oceanography. And that was all about linking the fish stock and ecosystem health to the ocean conditions as a key building block to ecosystem-based fisheries management. However, the data, especially the data at depth going into this science was problematic. So what we first saw as a path forward where fishermen could catch the data to improve this science um, so driving the necessary improvements for fishery science and then eventually management, but from a broader perspective as a way to build a bridge between these communities that traditionally haven't seen eye to eye. But it turns out it's not just us fishy people who are held back by this lack of data. There's a much broader usage group for oceanographic data, which really brings us here today with this oceanography focused presentation. And so the concept from my perspective, is really quite common sense. As fishing nets go down, fish along the bottom or through the water column and then come back up, sensors can be attached to them to go along for the ride. And so on the downs and back up, the sensors collect profiles of the water column properties. Then as the sensors surface, they can transmit their data to a collection point on the boat and then onto users all in near, near real time. And all of this can happen while fishermen go about their normal activities. There's no interruption or very little extra effort on the part of the fishermen. So this presentation is focused on the subsurface data as this is particularly difficult to collect with other platforms and fishing activities I feel are uniquely well suited to collect this kind of data. Two important distinctions with fishing gear in the way that they affect the type of data that can be produced. And these two classifications are mobile gears and fixed gears. 
So mobile gears such as trawling gears and are dragged through the water or along the bottom. This means that the location of the vessel and the sensors attached to the gear changes over time. This makes the produced data analogous to something like a glider track. The second type of fishing gear is fixed gear, which is lowered down to the bottom, fishes for hours to a few days, comes back up, hopefully with fish inside. And that means that the location of this gear doesn't change over time. And so this data is analogous to a more traditional CTD cast with the additional bottom time. And so now, we, now that we've seen a little bit about how data collection can be integrated with fishing, now I'm going to talk about why this can be so impactful to the ocean observation community and how this can complement the platforms and systems already in place today. I'm going to do that with a series of maps. This first map shows all of the subsurface data platform collections in 2017 and 2018. And this includes automated and opportunistic platforms. Basically, this means it includes everything except for research vessels. The key takeaway from this map is that most of the points are orange. Orange points are from Argo floats. Argo floats are, um, you can see, operate mostly in the deep ocean away from the continental shelf. So gridding this data coverage into mean monthly number of observa observations per grid cell, you can see the same pattern. There's relatively even coverage, but primarily in the, deep, in the deep ocean away from the coast. Now let's look at that same map, but instead we're now looking at fishing activity. The key takeaway here is that the hot spots of fishing activity, for example, around Iceland here, Faroe Islands, Shetland Islands, starting to come into the North Sea here, these hot spots are exactly where on this map the activity, the current observations are lacking. So this map over here with these red points mean that there are over 100, 100 or more fishing activity, uh, fishing activities that are well suited for integration with ocean data collection. And, and it's important to note that this color bar over here is 10x the color bar on the current observations. Um, and there are of course some exceptions here. Um, such as Northeast Greenland. Northeast Greenland is often covered by sea ice and is also a national park. That means that the sea ice complicates both fishing and ocean observation, but is also um, um, a national park, so fishing is prohibited. Now, this pattern that we've seen here with fishing activity concentrated where ocean data is lacking isn't limited to the North Atlantic. In fact, it's repeated in shelf seas and coastal waters around most of the world. So I'll do one more example. Um, and I like Alaska because it's a very clear pattern. So again, we've got primarily Argo observations in orange here. And then on the shelf, much less, much fewer observations. We've got a shallow water Argo deployment here, a few buoys in green here. And then these pink points, these are marine mammals with sensors attached to their heads or backs. So that's kind of a fun one. Um, now, let's look at the gridded versions of these maps. And again, that same pattern can be clearly seen where the fishing activity is concentrated exactly where the ocean observation is not. Now, it's not just that fishing activity takes place today where data is lacking, but actually it's especially important to get data in these regions. And that's for two key reasons. The first is that the shelf and coastal regions are subjected to complex and more rapidly changing ocean conditions than the deep open ocean. That means that models need more data to be accurate. The second re reason is that the coastal regions are where the majority of maritime activity takes place, both industry and recreation, far beyond commercial fishing. That means that these regions are where model and forecast accuracy matters most to stakeholders as well as maritime industries. One more key piece to this puzzle is the sensors. Sensors need to be compact, robust, and with automatic wireless connectivity so that they can send the data to a collection point without interrupting the flow of work on the vessel. So I'm gonna pause the presentation here momentarily to show two example, uh, two example sensors. 
So here, this is an NKE CTD. So this collects temperature, salinity down to 300 meters depth. You can see it's, it's reasonably compact, pretty small sensor. And, and the, another key feature of this is that this uses Wi-Fi connectivity. So it's well suited to medium and large vessels because it can transmit the data over a, a little bit longer range than other wireless connect connections. And this is, this is medium high resolution. So pretty good data quality out of this actually, which is surprising for these very small and compact sensors. In addition, the NKEs come with these very rugged protective housings. You can see these two, two pieces here that stand up well to the rigors of fishing and then have these nice attachment points to integrate with fishing gear. And this one you can see has been beat up a, a little bit. This is fished for nine months in the Bering Sea Aleutian Islands. So very rough volcanic bottom on a bottom trawl gear. And then after that fished in the Baltic are still fully functional. And the second example I want, to, I want to show is this much smaller uh, Zebra Tech. This is a prototype sensor developed in conjunction with the Moana project in New Zealand. A key distinction with this one is that this is temperature and depth, no salinity like the NKE I just mentioned. Um, lower resolution data and also uses, um, uses Bluetooth rather than Wi-Fi to transmit the data. Bluetooth uses less battery but, um, but can't transmit over as long distances. And so I'm gonna start up my presentation again here. The key takeaway to that is that different sensors for different applications, both in terms of data requirements, if you require very, very high resolution data, then that Zebra Tech probably won't work for you. But also from the way that the fishing gear is set up, Zebra Tech is probably better suited to very small scale fishing gear where the larger NKE might get more in the way. So down in the bottom, I've got some links to the two sensors I've just discussed, as well as a link to Lowell Instrumentation, which are the sensors used by the EMOLT program, one of our focus groups. Now, Two data examples, both of these data examples are collected with an NKE CTD. So that was the first sensor I showed. And this figure, the, this first figure in the lower left, this is a series of profiles collected over about two weeks off of Denmark. And you can see very clearly in the water column warming. So in the spring of 2019, the water column warming, as well as a very strong salinity gradient. Now this next visualization is how it shows up in the EMOD net physics data portal. And this is one trawl tow off the coast of Southern Norway. So you can see the, the descent down, the track along the bottom, and then the profiling back up, both for temperature and salinity. And then below the more traditional um, oceanographic perspective with the TS profiles. It's also important to note the, the metadata and links that are in that side panel there. Um, so those, this is data that we've collected, but programs that we're working with as well have their logos and links directly um, all through there. And Marco Alba is one of our panelists and he's the architect of all of this as well as this information in this portal. So feel free to ask him any questions about that during the Q&A session. Now, our first example program, EMOLT, um, as far as I know, this is the very first program to do this, started in 2001. Um, the acronym Environmental Monitoring on Lobster Traps um, has now been expanded and now works with trawlers, scallop dredges, long lines, etc. Um, EMOLT has approximately 40 vessels active that produce data from thousands of hauls per year. You can see in this blue chart the number of hauls increasing per year and is now about three and a half thousand hauls per year. And below that, a map of the distribution of hauls, mostly concentrated around Massachusetts, but then spanning a very long range along the US East Coast. And interestingly, really hugging that shelf break zone right there. EMOL also collaborates regionally with other programs, including the Northeast Cooperative Research Program Study Fleet, um, an industry organization, as well as an organization up in Canada. To me, the standout thing about EMOLT and what Jim Manning uh, and Jim Manning's work is the dialogue and feedback that's cultivated between the captains participating and the scientific community. 
And I'm hoping that there are several captains actually on this, this webinar right now. So thank you all very much for your work on this. And then down, down in the bottom right, we've got three papers about EMOLT and that middle one and especially, especially speaks to that, the benefits of that stakeholder involvement to the scientific community. Second example program, FOOS. So the Fishery and Oceanography Observing System. This is started by CNR, so the National Research Council of Italy in 2003, so not long after EMOLT. Um, its original form was the FOSS, the Fishery Observing System. And then in 2013, it was upgraded to the full FOOS system and Michaela Martinelli was a key leader in that process. FOOS has collected thousands of profiles, primarily from purseiners and trawlers in the Adriatic. The, the thing to note about FOOS is it is more of a complete system than many of the, the other programs. So it also includes kind of an electronic logbook for catch data um, and that kind of thing. So all of these data types are linked together. In addition, FOOS has been instrumental in experimentation and development of many different sensor types um, beyond simple physical parameters to biogeochemical and things like that. Um, system validation and system design, as well as the establishment of best practices. And you can see the links on the right here. There's quite a wide assortment there, um, so I, I recommend taking a look at some of these. Um, there's fishery science papers in here, there are oceanography assimilation experiments, there are data sets, there's best practice documentation, um, there's quite a lot there. Now, ocean modeling use cases. We're hoping to have more of these in the future, and this is a core goal of this in future initiatives. Right now, we don't have too, too many. The first is a statement from Dr. Yun Shi from the Danish Met Institute, speaking about a little bit of our data from Greenland, and not just to the quality of the data, but from my perspective, more importantly, to the availability of, and the potential to have data where it's currently lacking. The second is, one of these papers from Michaela and her colleagues at FOOS, and this is an assimilation experiment with the data in the Adriatic. And stay tuned because there should be a second paper coming in not too, too long with the more recent data set. Um, that recent data set is linked to on the previous page. And the EMOLT data goes to regional ocean modelers, but is also used in the lobster stock assessment. And to me, this is a real testament to the multidisciplinarity of this data. The final example from our colleagues in Japan, they collect CTD as well as ADCP, so acoustic Doppler current profiler data, and then this data is assimilated into a local ocean forecast. And the fishermen actually use this data to inform their fishing decisions. And this, this link is a very nice news story that came out uh, last week or maybe the week before. Uh, it's about three minutes and quite a nice little piece. So I take a look at that. So now, what are we at Bering Data Collective doing? So in addition to collecting data on vessels that we're working with independently, I feel our biggest impact is working to bring this community together and working to create a centralized data handling system. And we're building this all around the FAIR data standards. So FAIR stands for findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable. But we're doing this also with the added by also meeting the needs of stakeholders with confidentiality that doesn't compromise data quality for ocean data users. And I really feel that this is necessary for scaling this up and bringing everyone to the table. So we're aggregating data from both science and industry streams into this common relational database with quality control, metadata standards, and then passing it on by a flexible mechanism such as ERDAP to data users such as eMonNet. Programs that work with us and distribute their data have added exposure and impact from their data, but also have full traceability back to them as the data originators. On the flip side, the science uh, industry programs have the needed confidentiality and protection needed to participate. And we're doing this all in a way to maximize the data interoperability and reusability across different disciplines. And the key to this is the proper metadata standards to interact with the different scientific and industry fields. One final kind of technical tidbit here 
is how we're doing this is really with a, our core unique toe ID structure. So that means that data can be sent at any time. So that really makes this whole process more cost effective. So we can send data in real time, days or even months later, um, depending on the time sensitivity as well as being um, as not interrupting the flow of work on the fishing vessel. And so our goal is really to help you. If you're a fishing industry and fishery science and would like to start producing data, we'd love to talk to you about that and different sensor options, as well as the data collection opportunities with the fishing gears that you work with. If you are collecting data, our goal is to help you put this data to work and increase the impact of that data. And if you're an oceanographer, our goal is to get you to use this data and increase the accuracy of your models where it matters most for forecast users. And so shown here with myself is the core team in Denmark, as well as in Brussels. But we would not be here without the help and guidance from many, many others, as well as the on-call, larger, extended Bering Data Collective team. So many th I owe many thanks to many, many of you. Many of you are in the audience, um, and we look forward to working with more of you in the future. So now, as I begin to wrap up my talk, I want to, I want to discuss some, some exciting opportunities beyond subsurface data. Um, so we've been focused on this subsurface physical data. However, fishing vessels are not limited to just collecting this physical data, both with additional sensors on the net and additional sensors placed in other locations on fishing vessels. It's able, they are able to collect additional essential ocean variables as well as essential climate variables. And a key part of this is that these variables are co-located. This means that by collecting them from the same point, the same platform, there's added value because scientists are able to link what's happening beneath the surface of the ocean with the surface of the ocean with the atmosphere. And this co-location is key for coupled ocean and atmosphere models, as well as coupled biological and physical models. And this is the multidisciplinary modeling and science that we really strive to support. So to wrap up, we're working as hard as we can to facilitate this because we feel this can be so mutually beneficial with, with improvements compounding, not just for the fishing industry or oceanography, but to the broader blue economy, the health of our oceans and the future climate. This core concept is repeatable and scalable for most coastal waters around the world. And in addition, this data reusable in multiple disciplines. Furthermore, integration with these existing vessels means that this method of ocean observation can be cost effective. And so this is something that I hope may have the potential to, in a sense, democratize ocean observation. And this is both on an individual basis by engaging citizen scientists, but more broadly on an international basis by making ocean observation more accessible to nations with less resources that they're able to dedicate towards expensive ocean observation and monitoring. However, as has happened with this emerging network, a bottom-up approach is essential with local partners, programs, and fleets, the only way this will be possible to scale. And so we hope and look forward to working with many of you in the future. All right, so that's the end of my talk. Thank you all very much from myself, the rest of the Bering Data Collective team, as well as Iman Net Physics. If you've got any questions regarding this webinar, please, feel free to reach out to this, um, this email here. This will all be downloadable after as well as a video replay. And so now I'm going to hand off to Berta Vassenhaun, the co-founder of Bering Data Collective, to lead the question and answer session. Thank you very much, Cooper, for your uh, very interesting presentation. And uh, hello, everyone. Um, so before starting the Q&A session, uh, we have one last poll, which I will uh, launch now uh, regarding uh, possible future webinars. Um, and as uh, mentioned before for the Q&A session now, we have a few additional panelists uh, that I would like to introduce. Uh, so first of all, we have uh, Marco Alba, who is the uh, lead developer and data manager at EMOTNET Physics. Uh, then as the principal of um, 
integrating uh, sensors with vessels is more common in other maritime industries, such as shipping traffic. Um, we're very uh, happy to have Paul Holtas, the uh, president of the World Ocean Council, uh, on our um, panel. And WOC runs the Smart Ocean Smart Industries program. Um, and uh, this aims at increasing the impact of Ships of Opportunity programs by uh, leveraging industry participation. Then we have Jim Manning on our panel, who is uh, the founder of the EMOD program, previously um, presented by Cooper, as well as um, he's also involved in a variety of other uh, ocean citizen science projects. And last but not least, we have Michela Martinelli from the Italian FOOS program on our panel, uh, who's also done a lot of work on uh, sensor validation and uh, best practice uh, documentation. And then, of course, Antonio, Patrick uh, and Cooper are also still available for questions. Um, so I'll be moderating this session and may I remind you that you can keep on asking questions in the Q&A window down below. Um, and that you can also comment on existing questions and upvote questions that you find relevant. Um, um, so let's start uh, with the first question, which is a question um, that I find uh, very relevant and interesting from Julia Calderwood, who is asking uh, what benefits the fishermen get from uh, putting sensors on their fishing gears and whether there are particular incentives from uh, them doing this. Um, so I think uh, this is a question for uh, Jim and Michaela first. Uh, how do you do that in uh, your programs? How does it work? Yeah, I've found that um, nearly all fishermen I've, I've talked to are, are uh, convinced that the temperature ha has something to do with their day-to-day -day changes in, in catch. And so they are just curious. They're, they're interested in, in, in seeing the variability of the bottom temperature, which often most of the year uh, degrees different than, than what they measure at the surface. So it's, it's, it's not a uh, problem finding uh, fishermen um, willing to get set up with the uh, equipment. Okay, and Michela, how does it work in Italy? Yeah, well, here in the Mediterranean, the situation is a bit different because uh, not all fishermen are willing to participate to such kind of programs, but uh, we were lucky with uh, some of them volunteering to participate. And we, other fishermen, we made some agreements. Um, sometimes we had to pay for the data. Sometimes uh, uh, the agreement was, was different, but somehow, uh, we managed that. I should say that actually here the situation is quite more difficult because uh, vessels are sometimes smaller and uh, of course uh, fishermen uh, are not so willing in the Mediterranean to um, exchange information about uh, where they go to fish uh, and everything like this. So. Uh, in every part of the world, the situation could be different, and this has to be taken in account when planning a program like this. Interesting. Okay, thank you. Um, and Cooper, maybe do you have anything to add? How does it work at Bern Data Collective? Yes, I can. I can add to that. Um, you know, we've we've talked to quite quite a large range of very small scale to you know massive factory trawlers, and. Unfortunately, the answer to this, I feel, is really it's complicated. Fishermen are interested for different reasons. Um, you know, for these for these very large scale ones, it's really the the data analytics components and the fisheries management implications of collecting this data. Um, and then for the smaller scale guys, it's it can be it's very different. Um, but often, oftentimes, there's the the ecosystem and the climate change motive. You know, one one guy from my hometown. You know, I said, hey, you know, can I, can I come out on your boat and try this thing out? And he's like, ah, no, 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 we don't have people. And then I said, ah, no, 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 I don't, you know, I don't want to come out there and just to take pictures. I want to measure, measure the temperature and look at the catch and th things like that. And he said, Cooper, okay, you have to come out. We're seeing changes on there, under there and nobody's looking at this. So this is really important. And to me, to me, that was pretty exciting. Interesting. Um... 
Yes, and Paul, um, how does this, well, this is a question more from, uh, from me, but how does this work uh, in other industries? So we've got work going on through the, the World Ocean Council Smart Ocean Smart Industries program to really create a platform that, that uh, provides a place for the fishing industry to engage with other industries that are involved in, in data collection and voluntary observation programs. And as Cooper pointed out, it's, it's not just about oceanographic data, but it's also about weather and climate data. And so the other sectors, and especially as you can imagine, the, the shipping industry has long been engaged in, in providing weather data back to authorities. And in fact, a lot of what we know about how weather patterns uh, work and, and the forecasts that we have now come from the immense amount of data that comes from the shipping industry and the regular reporting. The um, overall, the, um, the uh, work through largely organized through the Intergovernmental Oceanographic Commission with whom we have a, a partnership agreement and the World Meteorological Organization with whom we also have a partnership agreement. Uh, they have been looking to expand the role of industry involvement in data collection from all the sectors. And so this is what uh, we're working to do through the Smart Ocean Smart Industries Program. And, and so the shipping industry, for example, then is interested to understand what the opportunities are to help fill some of the gaps as we've talked about this evening uh, by utilizing fishing fleets. Uh, likewise, the fishing industry can, can be complementary or its, its efforts can be complemented by what's going on in, the, in the, uh, the shipping industry, offshore renewables, offshore extractive industries, etc. And so really creating this, uh, this broader interrelationship between the industries on voluntary data collection really uh, and creates some great opportunities for synergies, for economies of scale, for uh, partnerships in sensor development uh, that reduces the cost so that we've got more um, uh, efficient, energy efficient, more easily installed uh, sensors for the fishing fleets and for other industries. So uh, this, this work uh, that is being talked about this evening, or sorry, my evening, uh, today uh, and in the proposed workshop, I think to really uh, move forward with organizing the, uh, the fishing industry can really play a major role in helping um, overall uh, accelerate and move forward with data collection from a variety of industries. Okay, thank you, that's clear. Um, next question from um, Martin Pastors, whether we're already working uh, with existing uh, sensors on fishing gear, such as SIMRAD sensors. Um, Cooper, that might be something uh, that you Yes. Can so I've been, been looking through here and seeing a lot of sensor-related sensor questions. So I'll yes. try and knock off quite a few of these <laughs> um, at, the same, at the same go here. Um, so thanks, Thank thanks, Martin. Yes, this, um, there have been a few different organizations who have worked with this. And actually, we just found a, a very exciting one um, that's, I think, done them more work than anybody, not using SIMRAD, but using MARPORT. Um, a few different industry bodies have used Marport. I've collected a little bit of SIMRAD. Um, we need more work on this and more analysis. Right now, the data, the bottom data from these existing sensors looks good, but there's, a, there's usually some problems with um, the measurement response time for the profiling. Um, so that's existing sensors, but I'm hoping that um, we can work with these these uh, sensor companies to increase the resolution of those, those sensors and the response time. Um, so there's a few different things about the depth of sensors. So NK, the NKE CTD is 300 meters, um, but there are NKE options for 1,000 meters and 6,000 meters. So there are different options there, as well as the ZebraTech, that one I showed actually goes to 1,000 meters as well. Um, oxygen sensors. Yes, there are a few different options there. Um, NKE has a new version coming out shortly or is out now. I'm not exactly sure. I haven't tried it out yet. Mm -hmm. um, also, also, Lowell Instrumentation is developing something um, for use on the West Coast with crab pots. Um, so how do you see this program in the future? Do you see this as um, have every fishing vessel uh, integrated with a, have a sensor or is it more interesting to have a small um, small subset per region uh, but uh, more spread over the world? Uh, what's your idea? 
Well, the more the better. Yeah, we, we start <laughs> small and then we build. <laughs> <laughs> no, actually, I mean, if we can really engage the community and work together in order to make mm -hmm. available this data massively uh, in terms of uh, time and spatial coverage, a lot of other communities would benefit from that. And for example, if we think about the benefit that you can have in order to feed the mode forecast, and then you give back better services to the people that are contributing to this data collection. So the more, the better. Okay. Maybe, maybe Berta, I'll jump in on that as well. Yes. Thank this you, is, Paul. Yeah, Paul Holt is from the World Ocean Council to put that, that, uh, question about scale and uh, the diversity of uh, components of the fishing industry to take it to a broader scope to think about the scale and diversity of other kinds of vessels and platforms that are in the ocean. And so when we, um, when we collectively think about the opportunities to scale up uh, and replicate the collection of data by uh, hosting or deploying sensors, there are, of course, um, the other industries that are sharing the ocean with the fishing industry. Uh, and these uh, other sectors, and in fact, shipping industry has been involved in data collection uh, in, uh, for both oceanographic and weather and climate data for uh, quite a long time through a variety of programs. And so at the World Ocean Council, we worked to develop that uh, scaling and uh, replication by having a global multi-industry platform which can benefit from the experience of and efforts of the fishing industry, but also uh, the fishing industry uh, in its uh, efforts and interest to, to scale up and, and further expand the data collection efforts can benefit from what's going on in other sectors. And so to be very practical and, and um, uh, to give some examples of this in terms of the sensor technology development, if essentially we have a bigger market that's beyond the fishing industry to include um, tourism, for example, vessels that are of similar size to fishing vessels, uh, the expedition tourism vessels, um, and then look even broadly, more broadly into the many other kinds of vessels operating. Uh, that creates a market for those that are developing the sensors that would help create uh, efficiency, standardization, and reduce costs, for example, in the sensors, and that will benefit the fishing industry. And so it really, um, uh, this, this scaling can really look at um, uh, a whole global network of multi-industry applications of effort to uh, data collection. Thanks. Thank you, Paul. Um, yes, and related to that, there is uh, another question about um, the use of these types of sensors more for um, people that use the ocean recreationally, such as sailing boats. Um, I'm also thinking about, for example, scuba divers. Um, it, has there any work been done uh, related to that? Um, well, there, there, uh, we have been interacting quite a bit uh, with the recreational uh, boating industry. Mm -hmm. And so there's quite a bit of effort there in real real citizen science level of uh, data collection and there's a variety of programs that have been working on that um, and uh, looking at how uh, to interface that with the, um, the the commercial operators and again that this creates uh, a bigger market uh, for the the uh, technology development and a, and a bigger uh, pool of data that can be collected um, from uh, from vessels and so there's been quite a bit of um, uh, interest in development along those lines. Uh, one of the particular topics that has been um, really harnessing the opportunities with the recreational vessels is, is the efforts to uh, collect bathymetric data, uh, for example. And so there's the, uh, and then we at the World Ocean Council, we're, we uh, ha are partners with the International Hydrographic Organization and a supporter of the Seabed 2030 uh, campaign. And so there's a particular piece there that's focused on recreational vessels. You mentioned scuba divers as well, and there's, there's certainly the, the, um, the marine tourism, marine ecotourism vessels are also a, a great opportunity for data collection. And then uh, beyond the scope of, I think, what we're discussing here, of course, divers that are actually in the water, there are entire um, citizen science programs there for them collecting um, in-water data through personal observations as well. 
I okay, just want you, just one small little addition to that because yes. there's, uh, there's a program in the Mediterranean called T MedNet, and T MedNet uh, have scuba divers who deploy mini loggers that um, then measure temperature. It's mm -hmm. really nice, and they we we're collaborating with them in EmoNet, and we're all already feeding data from these uh, uh, mini loggers. Uh, many of them, some of them have been there for up to twenty years. Very nice initiative. Interesting. Um, then I see also a lot of questions coming in more on the practical side of uh, the sensors used. Um, so uh, calibration times, um, cost price, um, other brands and models uh, of uh, loggers. Um, Michaela, I think you've done quite some work on that. Uh, yes, of course. Uh, we've been working with two different kind of probes because uh, uh, we started with the first version of our observing system we, using mini loggers from Starodi, and then when we changed it to FUS, uh, we moved to Enki probes. And um, we did uh, some evaluation of the two probes uh, uh, through the work that we see in our, and as well our colleagues from Infonet. We worked together jointly mm, in the framework of uh, uh, the European Jericho, Jericho Next, and Nexus projects to uh, develop these uh, sensors from Henke. Uh, so uh, um, we also uh, tried to uh, start some uh, best practice procedure to draft some uh, best practice procedure uh, for uh, the use of this kind of sensors and uh, um, there are some few documents that are as well which is linked in the presentation um, what i can just uh, suggest uh, before uh, somebody is very interested to move to this uh, these uh, papers uh, there are two important things to um, take in account while choosing a sensor to be mounted on a fishing gear uh, and uh, it is of course the operational conditions so it depends a lot on the fishing gear that you are using and uh, the sensor that you want to, to choose depends as well on uh, the fishing gear and on uh, your uh, requirement from the oceanographic point of view and uh, you also we strongly suggest also to uh, make some trials with the sensors before uh, using uh, it on the fishing gear uh, compare uh, it uh, with the traditional oceanographic tools if we, if you are used to work with, with it uh, and define offsets that will be able to you when you will handle your data uh, to use together with the data of course and uh, from time to time, it's uh, a good idea to repeat these procedures, but maybe I went too technical on this, uh, on this part. Um, always about the sensors, uh, we are talking about, uh, until now, about uh, CTD-like sensors, but uh, there are other uh, probes uh, in development, some, some of those that has already been developed for oxygen and chlorophyll, and there are new developments going on and uh, uh, we are participating as well uh, uh, in these developments uh, together with the NKIHO company, but as uh, Cooper suggested, there are other companies as well working on this side, so maybe Cooper can add something. Cooper, do on you have something? On sensors in general. Um, yeah, <laughs> sensors in general, um, I won't, and Michaela did, it, did that very well, so yes, different options. Um, I wanna add two things to that, I think really, Technically, more what we're missing is a, mm, a more modular deck system and a, a system for that. And that's very challenging on a fishing vessel. Fishing vessels, the layout, even you know, within the same fleet, will be very, very different uh, depending on how each captain does. So modularity of those systems it can be pretty tricky. Um, the other thing on a more positive note is that there, there are calibration opportunities for these sensors since the fishing vessels come into port in, in regular frequency. And that's actually pretty unique 
uh, compared to other ocean observation platforms, which can, are very, very expensive to go out and bring them back in for calibration or just can never be calibrated again. Um, Going to um, take one last question, um, which is whether we're uh, collecting or accepting um, also data from other sm small scale experiments um, using data loggers from coastal areas. That's, I think, more an EMOTNET question. Uh, we're, we're, we're totally, um, uh, we say yes. That's what we say. <laughs> any, any, any data, uh, please let us know. And we're very, very interested to, um, to, to take any, anything on board. Okay. Thank you, Patrick. Um, and with that, uh, I would like to wrap up this session and uh, thank the panelists and the presenters for um, the interesting program today. Um, and of course, the audience uh, for attending. Um, we will be in touch with more information uh, with the PDF version of the presentation uh, with the recording links. Um, and in the meantime, please do not hesitate to contact us if uh, we can help you uh, with anything uh, through the ffd at emotmatphysics.eu uh, website. And Patrick, you also wanted to... Oh, just saying that we will also answer all the questions. And yes. we will make them available, the, all the answers as well, yeah. together with uh, the links to, to the, the webinar and so on. Yes. yes. Okay. Thank you very much um, and hope to see you soon. Thank you. Thank Thanks, you. everybody. Thank you. Bye, Thank you, everybody. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you.